Today's speaker is Dr Glenn Fox, who joined Coffee this time eight years ago. And he is renowned for his research in barley, malting and brew quality. And this research was, and his contribution to the industry was recognised when this year he was made a fellow of the Institute of Brewing and Distilling. And today he's here to talk to us about the importance of starch in brewing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bernadine. Thanks everyone for coming. I know everyone's very busy uh, and even I will uh, be an absentee from time to time for these seminars, but I do stream them uh, at some point. So uh, for the last couple of years, I've given presentations on some of the research we've been doing in brewing. And really this year was sort of an accumulation of a number of students that we've been working with uh, on looking at starch properties in relation to mar barley malting and brewing. So I wanna showcase some of the work that they've done. Um, and the underlying question that we're sort of challenging industry now with is we routinely measure content, so we routinely measure protein content, um, but we don't measure the individual components or the individual proteins within protein content, and also measuring starch. We measure total starch, but do we measure the structure and even amylose and amylo content routinely? Well, the answer is simply no. The industry doesn't measure it. Uh, it doesn't even measure starch routinely. So we're trying to sort of come at it from a side angle and say, well, actually, we're providing you with some really useful data now that you should start considering content and composition uh, it together. So I do want to acknowledge a bunch of people first, and certainly the students, Wen Wen and Wei, or Rex, sorry, Rex, um, <laughs> and previous students, Peter and Shang, and a couple of honours students, Megan and Eva, who have done a lot of work in some of the barley and malt quality we've done. But certainly we've had support from the Queensland Government with the lab I still uh, occupy in Toowoomba. Um, some of the big brewers and molsters have also supported uh, some of our research. Uh, Ben's here from School of Chem. He helps us with a lot of proteomics work. Uh, and we've done a fair bit over the years on barley, malt, beer, and even that strange crop, sorghum. Uh, and coffee staff, and certainly uh, Bernadine and, and Nima helping some of the students because I'm sort of not normally here. Uh, and I sort of uh, asked them to help, uh, and they're very, very helpful and, and supportive, both Bob and Mike, uh, in leading some of this starch analysis. But as I said, many of the postgrads that we've worked with um, over the years, so I'm really uh, showcasing their data uh, because they haven't had a chance to, to present it at a formal seminar. So I do like to start off with some beer facts and some beer funnies. So there's a few interesting questions and answers there that most people wouldn't know what most of these things are. Um, but there's some really interesting facts and the brewing industry really has driven a lot of scientific innovation over the years. So everyone's familiar with using a pH meter that was developed at Carlsberg Brewery. Pasteur was working at Carlsberg when he discovered the, the function of yeast. Um, so there's a lot of history around brewing, uh, but there's some interesting new things going on uh, in, in brewing. Uh, and certainly there's always these interesting trivia points that we like to talk about. So I'll just go through the usual stats. Uh, it's always important to put some perspective uh, on where the industry is. Go through the malting and brewing process because often people don't really understand that these are two separate processes and we actually need malt to make beer normally. Um, the process of, of those two processes are very complicated uh, and it really is a combination of science and art. Uh, we talk about starch itself, the effects of, effects of mashing and a couple of flavour issues. Um, so lots of stats there, but uh, overall, um, the brewing industry around the world, in except for a couple of markets, is on the decline. Uh, the alcohol market is plateauing, so that's even with wine and spirits. Uh, but the alcohol market is, is generally declining around the world. The only two growth industries at the moment, or growth areas, are Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And mainly in Asia, it's, it's China and India. And a few years ago, we can see now that China doubled the production of the US. So while it's a huge market, they're only still drinking about 20 litres per head per annum. So in terms of total consumption, they're still very small, but just sheer volumes they have to produce is very, very large. Um, Australia's sort of been, been hit by that sort of global trend and decline in beer consumption. Um, and through a number of different, uh, reason, for a number of different reasons that's happened, um, but what's sort of kick-started the industry again is, is, is the craft industry. Uh, so the craft industry currently in Australia, there's about 500 craft breweries. 
and there's one opens in Australia about once a week. So it's a huge growth. Uh, it's worth about $500 million at the moment. And there's a significant investment in all states to look at how both governments and industry can partner with, with people that want to start up craft breweries. Um, and often it's somebody's just made beer at home and thought, well, I make a good beer, I'm going to try and scale that up and, and make a saleable product. Um, doesn't always work because their beer wasn't that good. Um, <laughs> but their friends were never honest enough to tell them. Um, but most people are actually making good beer and there's a lot of innovation in the industry, again, where the brewing industry brings innovation uh, and it's often around adding new flavours, whether it's some cra crazy chocolate, chilli combination or some really interesting what we'd call food science going on. Uh, so it's really the craft industry that's driving the continued uh, growth in, in beer consumption. Generally, and certainly in Australia, barley is the main raw material used in brewing production. But around the world, other crops are used. In Africa, sorghum is the main crop. Um, but that people will use barley and wheat in combination to make wheat beers. Uh, and they'll also use barley and rice or barley and corn as an adjunct. Um, and that's sort of some famous beers in America uh, that use barley and rice combinations. But in Australia, we produce around eight to nine million tonnes. That's had a bit of a hit this year. We're down to about six, there's the forecast, because of the drought. Um, so that's having a big hit. Uh, but this rain will help finish those crops off and hopefully uh, help the summer crops to be planted. So it's a reasonably valuable crop. It's worth about 16 billion to the economy. Uh, and Australia, we're in the top 10 in terms of world production, uh, but we're in the top three, normally top two for exports of barley and malt. Uh, we do actually produce a very high quality product. Of that 8 million tonnes, about 30% actually achieves the malting grade. And I'll, I'll mention a couple of the specs around that, why it's actually a challenge to meet that. And malting barley is the hardest crop of any crop to get a quality accreditation. The industry is very tough, and there's three years of industry assessment before a variety gets accredited as malting. So it's much tougher than the wheat industry and, and much tougher than nearly any other crop. So for, for a barley breeder, this is a huge undertaking. Um, Locally, Australian brewers only need about 400,000 tonnes of that 3 million tonnes. Um, but the rest is either exported as barley or made into malt and exported as malt. And we're one of the top two malt exporters in the world. Uh, normally Canada, uh, Canada is our competition. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff comes out of the EU now and certainly out of the Ukraine and the Baltic. There is a difference between the quality for a domestic brewer as well as an export brewer. And the craft brewers is a new market. We're still, still trying to understand what the craft brewers uh, want and how we can help them and the maltsters deliver uh, malt that will meet these craft brewers' expectations. So this is a fairly detailed table, but it's about one-tenth of the length of the table. If you look on Grain Trade Australia website, these are the specifications that a farmer must meet to get a variety uh, graded as malt. So for the farmer to get the premium, he has to meet these specifications. And if we look down here, the variety is important. Uh, moisture, it's got to be less than 12.5%. We can't put wet grain into a silo. Uh, there's a minimum maximum specification for protein. So there's already protein here on the spec. Uh, and there's actually a minimum and maximum. If they're under that or over that, they won't get malt one. Uh, but there's also weight and grain size. Uh, and some germination because it's important when, when we go to malt. And all the other list and the page, it takes two pages of this, uh, all the other um, defects and contaminants, uh, weed seeds and all the things that the farmer must abide to and meet before we can get a malt classification. Um, but just looking down these top three or four, there's no mention of starch. They talk about protein, it's easy to measure. Um, and around the world, every tr everyone trades barley on protein content. Uh, then there's a measure of grain size. So again, no mention of starch or any other quality parameters. We know that there's a negative correlation between protein and starch content. And we know that bigger grain has more starch. So it's a surrogate measure for having lots of starch. And we need lots of starch to make beer. And I'll go through that shortly. So this is really the first grading system uh, for anyone to consider uh, malting and then brewing, and there's no mention of anything other than protein. So the malting and brewing process is actually a two-stage process. You rarely find a malt house and a brewery together. A malt, malt house is a very separate industry, uh, and breweries, again, separate to that. 
Um, so the malting process quickly is just going through a wetting stage where the grain is immersed in water, it's allowed to germinate, and then it goes through a drying process. So the kilning process is a bit like roasting coffee. The kilning can actually impact on flavour and colour. Um, and these can be any sorts of grains. They can be barley, wheat, sorghum, corn, buckwheat, and even some strange other grains that people try to, to make malt from. Certainly the gluten-free industry is looking for these alternative grains. It can be, once it's dried, it can be stored, but then going to the brewery, it's milled and goes through this mash tun and lauder, which is really the cooking point. And this is where all the conversion of starch to sugars is really happening. After that, we've basically got the profile in the wort, the liquid, that is there for the rest of the process and certainly as a preparation for the brewing process, you know, the fermentation process. So this step here is really the conversion step, conversion of starches and conversions of proteins that'll be used downstream. We add hops for bitterness. So in the 1200s, the, some monks in, in Europe discovered they could abs, add hops. Uh, it changed the flavour considerably, but also they used it to sterilise the product. Um, so we add hops for the bitterness uh, and there's many types of hops we can add for flavour and aroma, as well as the bitterness. Um, after we sort of clear all that, uh, we filter, uh, cool, and then we go to fermentation. And again, this is another complex step because we use a specific type of yeast, and the yeast can utilise the sugars in different ways. Um, and Ben and Ed are here, and Ed's doing a PhD on yeast uh, specifically. Um, so it's really a complex part of the process and there's many debates at brewing industry conferences that talk about which is more important, malt or the yeast. And you have your yeast side and you have the malt side and very few people are in the middle. So moving on, um, once, once you've had some malt made and you want to buy some malt for your brewery, these are the sort of the specifications you'll get. There's some, something to do with colour, uh, which is important because that goes through into the, into the beer. Uh, we need low moisture what we call extract or the amount of soluble material we can get. Um, there's a difference in how we actually prepare that. Um, diastatic power, which is really about the enzymes that will convert the starch to sugars. Again, protein keeps popping its head up. Uh, total protein, soluble protein, uh, and then some other physical characteristics. So again, this is what a, a brewer will get on the spec sheet that he buys when he buys his malt. Uh, no mention of starch, no mention of fermentable sugars. Uh, no mention of gelatinisation, and many brewers will say uh, that this is just a guide to help them do their brewing. Um, they sort of know after getting malt, buying malt for many years that those specs, they know how to use those specs to produce the product they want, but often they'll say that during the mash it goes too quick or too slow, and then as a result the fermentation goes too quick or too slow. Now for the big breweries, that's okay because they're producing such volumes that they can normally hold over beer and blend away stuff that might be out of their spec. But for craft brewers, they get one shot. They don't have 20,000 litre storage tanks out the back where they can hold a bad brew <laughs> and blend it away later on. It's basically the brew today is what they've got to ferment and package next week. So again, there's some missing information here, but the industry sort of accepts this. This is a a very conservative industry. Um, they know that these things are missing, but at this point, they're not willing to really jump uh, to any new specifications, but we're still providing them with, with data to consider this. So we know there's a lot of physical changes during the process, uh, and on the right here is really what starch granules look like after the malting and brewing process, but they will end up in, in solid material um, and what we call the spent grain. So after we've actually mashed the malt with water, uh, and all the soluble components go into the liquid. Uh, there's a lot of solid material comes out, which is normally sold off as animal feed. Uh, but even there's still residual starch granules present in what we call the spent grain. This plot on the left is showing the changes in the starch during that process. Uh, we can see here this little bump here is the amylose structure. Um, this yellow peak here is actually the residual sugar. Uh, so there's, we see a complete loss of amylose, but there's still a small amount of dextrin here, uh, and even between these two samples, there's difference. And this yellow component here is actually what we call the dextrin, and that contributes to mouthfeel in beer. 
So if you're drinking Asahi Dry or some other dry beers, they've actually added the dextrinase to actually get rid of this dextrin uh, during the brewing process. So if you looked at the wort uh, sugar profile, you wouldn't see, a, wouldn't see a single bump here. It would be a flat line. But for most beers, they're looking for a small component of this, of this dextrin because it adds mouthfeel uh, to the beer. So it's really a simple process and we'd all be familiar with the simple uh, kinetics of substrate plus enzymes equal products. In our case, we're looking at starch. Uh, the enzymes are what we call diastase enzymes, which are alpha, beta amylase, limit dextrinase and uh, glucoamylase. And the product are the sugars and non-fermentable sugars. Now for 100 years, the brewers have focused on this. They haven't considered this and they don't consider this when they're actually selling malt. Conversely, the brewers don't ask for this when they're buying malt. Um, so my position is for, these, for the industry now is to consider, we can know our enzymes and we know them very well, uh, but we need to know the substrate. Because without knowing the substrate, you have no idea what's gonna happen here. And when a brewer complains that his fermentation goes out of control, we sort of say, well, have you do you know the gelatinisation before you mashed? No, don't know that, we don't get that measured. Do you know your fermentable sugar profile before you fermented? Are you pitching your yeast at a certain rate that matches your sugar profile? No, we just pitch at a certain volume all the time. So there's some missing bits of information for them, but also they need to know there's information they can use so they can actually be more efficient at this process. And as I said, virtually no research in the substrate, but plethora of research in this area here of the enzymes. Um, it's been done to death. Um, and ironically, from a breeding perspective, they just want to keep making more enzymes. You know, they're trying to breed higher and higher levels of these enzymes. They're yet to say, well, have we reached enough of the enzymes? Can we consider the starch? Should we be fixing the starch up as well? So uh, we know most of this. Uh, this is the starch synthesis process. Um, through adipose up to starch synthase, starch synthase 2, branching, debranching enzymes to produce amylopectin, which is around 75%. Textbooks say that, but we've seen it between 70 and 80%. And then to produce amylose, it's granule bound synthase, about 25%, but again, we've seen 20 to 30%. So there, those numbers are, are flexible. We can knock out one of these to produce a waxy uh, or high amylose type but the brewing industry doesn't really take any interest in those. But what is interesting is people have found um, allelic variation in some of these genes here, and a couple of examples. One, uh, in sorghum we found, or Ian Godwin's group in SAFs, found an allele in the debranching or pullulinase enzyme here, and actually changed the amylopectin structure so that it was more digestible. Uh, so that's a good thing for the feed industry, cattle industry. And one of our students look, looking at rice and the Australian wild rice has found that there were two copies of starch synthase 2 and it actually changed, no sorry, two copies of the granule bound starch synthase and it changed the amount of amylose. So normally in domesticated species we've knocked out multiple copies of things um, but in this case the Australian wild rice retains two copies and makes more amylose. So in terms of structural effects the branching and debranching enzymes is really what's making this tree-like structure here. Um, and this actually is happening during grain filling periods. So this is happening in the field. So we know that the limit dextrinase is present before the grain matures. So it's actually controlling the degree of branching here. And this is the amylopectin, it's a long, sorry, the amylose, it's a long chain, but there is the odd branch on the amylose as well. So from a, from a taking it from the lab to the field, um, this is the hierarchical structure of how these starch polymers are made, uh, forming these crystalline and amorphous, amorphous layers. These growth rings, these growth rings form uh, the, the granules in the endosperm. And that's what our grain looks like. But this is what the barley looks like in the field. Uh, so this is a beautiful crop of barley just uh, out, out near Toowoomba, I think. Um, but even within this field, there's variation in structure, variation in starch structure. We have variation in chain length, degree of branching of the amylopectin, uh, variation in the AB granules and variation in the protein starch relationship. So everyone's probably seen protein maps from fields. So we know that across a wheat field or a, or a barley field, there'd be variation in protein. 
and it matches a variation in yield. So certainly in Australia, maybe in Europe, where they get more consistent rain um, and they've got a lot more sort of consistent production, they don't see this variation. But in Australia, this is a typical farmer's field where we see huge variation of high protein, uh, sorry, low protein to high protein here. Uh, but conversely, we could see that in starch. So if you've got variation in protein, you have variation in starch and you would have variation in other parameters. Um, so we're challenging the industry again to think about where their sources of variation are coming from. Um, they think about protein and yield, uh, but also all the other components in the grain. So once that grain is harvested, so variety X uh, might be taken from one farm, but there's many loads, but they might be taken from many farms and put in storage. So we'd all see these big concrete silos. You drive out in the country, they're, they're all over the place. So in one of those silos, uh, there might be 5,000 tonnes of a single variety, but that's been accumulated from several farmers. Now the malt house will ring up and say, I need 10,000 tonne of a certain variety. So they deliver 10,000 tonne to the malt house and they go through the process of making malt. They'll store the malt either at the malt house or at another facility. So they'll have 10 or 20,000 tonnes of variety X and variety Y and maybe variety Z all sitting in storage. Then the brewer will ring up and say, I need 10,000 tonnes of malt at this spec. They haven't said a variety, they've said malt at a specification. So the maltsters blend together a couple of malts, malt one and two, to meet the brewer's spec. So all along this chain, there's been significant variation on sources of variation coming in. And that's when the brewer, he's making his brew, he just can't get the conversion in the mash tub. And when he goes to ferment, fermentation doesn't go perfectly. It doesn't go to plan, it's too quick, it's too slow, and they've got problems all the way. Uh, but as I said, the big breweries can deal with those. So for, for the craft industry, they want to get a certain variety. They can get it from a certain farm. It can go to a certain pilot malting facility. That variety will go to the brewer. So there potentially is a lot more control along this for the craft industry. But again, the malt specifications will be the same. The craft guys are still missing out on important information. They don't get gelatinisation properties. They don't get fermentable sugar potential. So again, this is a missing piece of data for the industry. So most of us will be familiar with the process of, of measuring starch using size exclusion chromatography. So basically the, the small molecules and the large molecules pass through the column at a different rate. And as a consequence, we can measure uh, size. Uh, so th this is our uh, plot for the amylopectin and amylose. Uh, we can actually see slight variation here between these six barley samples. Slight variation in the amylose peak, uh, in both in the size and the amount and the length of the amylose molecules. Um, variation in degree of branching of myelopectin. The textbooks will say five to six percent. Well, we've seen two to ten percent. Um, this is fairly normal. We do see these. Um, but significant variation in the amylose content. Uh, and normally we don't see a lot more than about 4,000, but the average we'll get in is between 1,000 and 4,000. So over a few years now, we've been measuring the average chain length of amylose. So this is over 300 barleys and malts that we've measured. And this is the average chain length. So the x-axis is the average chain length of amylose. So it goes from about 8,000 glucose units to 5,000 glucose units. So it's a significant difference in the average amylose chain length. All of these samples are malting grade. So all of them are in that 9 to 12% protein window. So these are samples that farmers are delivering to a malt house and malt houses are selling to brewers. So that's the quality we're looking at. The range in starch content varied from 40 to 47 to 64%. So really we can't use starch content as a guide. The range in amylose was 22 to 32%. And again, 25% is the published value. So potentially we can't use amylose content as a guide. Huge difference, eightfold difference in average chain length. And the important thing here is there's over 10 degree difference in gelatinisation. So the difference in gelatinisation for these samples is 58 to 68 degrees. That's a huge difference. Most breweries in Australia, around the world, 
are mashing in at 64 to 65 degrees. So if you've got malt potentially at above 65 degrees, it's going to take a lot longer to gelatinise, to solubilise in the mash, and the enzymes that convert the starch to sugars are going to be fairly useless by the time the starch is fully gelatinised. So this is a significant issue. But again, nobody's me measuring gelatinisation in the industry. So a couple of examples. Up there, we've got 60% starch and 30% amylose. But down here, 30% amylose and 60% starch. <laughs> so we can't use starch or amylose content as a guide. We know starch structure, uh, amylose structure is a better guide for gelatinisation. But it's not an easy thing to measure. And it's certainly not every, something every lab in Australia is going to run out and buy an SEC to measure gelatinisation or amylose structure. So, OK, let's just take a breather. Some more beer facts. I find the second one rather disturbing. Um, why anyone would want to deep fry some beer. I'm not even sure how he did it. Um, but a couple of interesting things. And I have been here in Slovenia. Uh, where there's actually a beer fountain in the park. Uh, and that's it there. And these are the fountains here. So you just pay some money, uh, you get your glass, and you just walk over and pick your beer. Um, we did spend quite a long time in that park that afternoon. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so what's happening with gelatinisation? So again, this is a go back to our biochemistry 101, substrate and enzymes. So here's our starch granules, here's our, here are our enzymes. Um, as the starch swells in the mash due to heating, the amylose leaches out, uh, and then the enzymes will move into the granule itself, and then we have our product produced here. Um, so what's really happening here? Uh, this is a, something that Wen Wen did. Uh, so we have different enzymes doing different things. So the alpha amylase is actually cleaving the chain uh, randomly. The beta amylase can only cleave off maltose, so two glucose from the end of the chain, uh, and it systematically works its way along. Uh, and then the limit dextrinase will cleave the 1 6 branch. So it's a very synergistic relationship between these three enzymes. The unfortunate thing is beta amylase and limit dextrase are very sensitive to temperature. So again, in Australia, breweries are mashing at 64, 65 degrees. <coughs> Both of these enzymes are fairly inactive. <laughs> within about 10 or 15 minutes at 65 degrees. So they have a very short time to do a lot of work. They're very, very busy, um, but if the starch isn't available for them, they can't do much. So it changes the profile of the fermentable sugars and non-fermentable sugars if these enzymes aren't active. So my colleagues in food science, uh, you can have a few minutes nap. Um, we measure gelatinisation using differential scanning calorimetry. Um, it basically measures the melting point of starch. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward method. Um, it's certainly used a lot in the food industry, but this is potentially a new thing for the, the malting and brewing industry to consider. What we found is that there's actually a difference between the barley gelatinisation and the corresponding malt gelatinisation temperatures. And 99% of the time, the malt gelatinisation temperature is higher than the barley <coughs> gelatinisation temperature. And that's because the, am the granules have been in broken up, the amylose is leached out, and it actually changes the thermal properties of the malt. <coughs> uh, so while the malt gelatinisation temperature can go up a little bit, and here's one well over 67 degrees, uh, there's less energy required to actually melt the starch. So in terms of malt, it's easier to actually degrade the sugar, melt the, sugar, the starch, um, but the gelatinisation temperature is much higher. Uh, <coughs> so a number of factors that influence the gelatinisation temperature. We know the amylopectin content, which is also the amylose content, the ratio of these two, amylopectin to amylose, uh, the average chain length of these two. There's an interaction with the starch and protein, uh, granule architecture, <coughs> And certainly processing, we've seen that the effects of different malting conditions change the malt quality and gelatinisation properties. In general, we see more amylose will increase your gelatinisation temperature. So if there is a target for the breeders at the moment, we could say breed for slightly lower amylose content. 
but it's more likely that's controlled by environment, not by genetics. We need some shorter amylose chain lengths. Well, no, so we don't need shorter, we need longer amylose chain lengths because the short ones will increase gelatinisation. So again, we can potentially control the shorter chain length with genetics, but again, that's probably more an environmental influence. And as I said, the range we've seen is 58 to 68 degrees. Remember the magic number in Australian brewing and certainly most breweries overseas is 65 degrees. If it's above 65, potentially there's problems. <coughs> So what does the gelatinisation temperature do? If we've got a high gelatinisation temperature, what happens? So we see a negative correlation between gelatinisation temperature and maltose. Now maltose is that glucose glucose that's cleaved off the end of the chains. It's about 60 to 70 percent of total fermentable sugars. <coughs> when we're doing a high temperature mash, which is one of these industry mashes, um, generally we see a negative correlation between the peak gelatinisation temperature and this 65 degree mash. So the higher the gelatinisation, potentially the lower or less fermentable sugars you'll get. If you're getting less fermentable sugars, you're getting more non-fermentable sugars. And that will impact on other flavour components in the beer. Conversely, this is the industry standard. So if you buy malt, they will do this test for you. European mash conditions. So when you look at your malt spec sheet and it says extract, this is the method they've done. Hmm, I don't see much of a correlation here with fermentable sugars. And that's basically the different process of the mash they do. It's a much low temperature, slight increase to 65 degrees over about an hour. So it really is favouring all the enzymes to do their business and to degrade all the substrates, not just starch. So it's really the best case scenario. You're the best your malt could ever be. Um, but it really is totally unrelated to commercial practice and this method really will not give you any information on your fermentable sugar profile. They actually do fermentations from this method with the wort so I would be concerned that actually from that fermentation result because the fermentable sugars produced from that wort aren't re relevant to any sort of fermentation. And as I said <coughs> this negative relationship it impacts on fermentation and that'll impact on alcohol yield and flavour and a few other things. So what we're saying is here, you've got your gelatinisation sweet spot or your sweet wort spot, <coughs> which is around this 64, 65 degrees for about 30 minutes. <coughs> These are our three main enzymes, limit dextranase, beta amylase and alpha amylase. And you can see after about 20 minutes, they're well, pretty well done. And by 30 minutes, they're almost completely done, um, certainly below 50% of their activity. But we can see here this black line, the fermentable sugar production. So after all the enzymes are done, there's no more fermentable sugars produced. So if the enzymes are done in 20 minutes, that's your fermentable sugar profile. And you probably have underhydrolyzed your starch. If that's your purpose, you've done, it, you've done it well, but most brewers don't want to do that. So the longer to get reach gelatinization, uh, you have reduced enzyme activity and that impacts on your fermentable sugar profile. So more than 10 years ago, these guys suggested, or these people suggested, uh, gelatinisation of, would be a very good method to measure, or uh, trait to measure in the industry. Um, they recommended it, so 13 years, they still haven't, the industry still hasn't adopted this method. Um, so we're sort of rattling some cages again to say there's, there's better ways to do this. Um, so the brewers and the molsters say, well, we all can't go out and buy a DSC. The irony is they probably got a similar instrument in their labs already, and that would be an RVA, or rapid visco analyzer. It's not exactly the same as DSC. It doesn't measure exactly the same thing. Um, it sort of has a similar profile. Um, there's a point here where it reaches mashing temperature at 65 degrees, and then it cools. Uh, we can see the change in the pasting properties of the starch. Um, I, but this is a normal, the plot on the right, it's a normal mash profile where we go in at 65 and ramp up to about 75 uh, just to make sure we've denatured those enzymes in the mash. Um, so just by tweaking the profile we can actually see that the RVA will potentially be a substitute for the DSC. Um, with some interesting correlation here, peak time and pasting temperatures correlate well with the DSC peak temperature. 
So I think with a bit of tweaking, we can develop an RVA profile that the, the maltsters could use. So then the brewers could say, well, give us gelatinisation uh, on our malt specs. Um, and as I said, most malt houses will have an RVA. Uh, no malt houses have a DSC. As I mentioned earlier, there's some confounding relationships between starch and protein. So remember, protein and starch have this negative relationship. So we have low protein, we generally have high starch, uh, generally. Uh, so here's just some samples from Wen Wen's work. We looked at two different locations, uh, quite a variation in protein content on this y-axis. Some of these are very high in protein content uh, and others very low. And we can see here in the plot, big differences and certainly in the amylase peak uh, in the amount and ch average chain length of some of these. So there is the relationship between protein and starch. And what's happening in the granule is it's a bit like a, uh, the granule is the ball and there's a protein matrix that surrounds the ball. So we have more protein matrix that limits the potential growth of the starch granule. And this is a gap in, in even physiology. We really don't understand the relationship between protein synthesis and starch synthesis and the interaction between those uh, and when it starts, when they stop and what environmental factors are driving those those synthesis uh, pathways. Um, <coughs> so the relationship between protein and some individual proteins, uh, some high molecular weight glutenins and the major storage proteins, the hordines, um, again, significantly ne negative correlations to the fermentable sugars. So it really does uh, let the industry off the hook a little bit because saying, well, if it's within protein spec, um, we know we're gonna have a lot more starch, that's fine, but starch isn't everything. We can actually see uh, that starch is about size and molecular weight of the two polymers. Uh, but it is good to see that in general, there's a negative correlation between protein and the individual proteins and the sugars. So the industry's off the hook a little bit. Okay, fairly uh, populated biplot here. Uh, between malt, barley uh, and the sugars. These are all structural components. Um, uh, gelatinisation properties here um, and some of the starch structural properties here. So we actually can see these negative or these opposing vectors here suggest that what's high here is low here. So it, again, it supports the relationship between high gelatinisation properties and starch. Uh, and there's that negative relationship in the biplot between the individual sugars and proteins. Uh, as I said before, <coughs> the spent grains still can hold a lot of the starch, so there's a lot of energy uh, and sort of unrecoverable wort and sugars that are left over in the spent grains. We can see here in a really low protein sample, these granules are completely disintegrated. The higher the protein we go, the granules are still almost intact. Um, so and this sample on the right here, on the top, is the same sample here within the spent grain. So with inadequate gelatinisation, inadequate mashing, then you're still ending with a lot of starch in your spent grain. So that's a lot of cost to hopefully get uh, fermentable sugars and extract out of the malt that now is going to feed an animal because it's going into the spent grain. Actually, <coughs> the new innovations in spent grain, we can actually make cardboard and do other things with this, so it's not completely wasted, but um, from a brewer's perspective, that's lost money because there's extract and fermentable sugars going out the drain. All right, <coughs> nearly done. Last couple of beer facts. Uh, ben, you like this one. Yeast is not an ingredient <laughs> until Mr. Pasteur said so. Um, I was going to put up an inappropriate figure here, a Belgian lace, but I thought I'd better not. Um, so really it's just describing the foam or the beer cling as you drink your beer, though the foam stays on the glass. And who would want to give beer to a moose? Is that like drinking, giving your dog some beer or giving your horse some beer? Okay, <coughs> last bit here. <coughs> so certainly in the craft industry, there's been sort of a, an interest to use single varieties from a single region. So we have a farmer who grows malting barley, it goes to the local malt house, that local malt house will produce a malt and it goes to the craft brewers. And it's to do with providence and regionality. 
And a lot of industries, food industries especially, are jumping on the bandwagon of, of it's produced locally. Everything is produced locally. The craft industry is certainly doing the same and they've re resurrected some heirloom varieties. <coughs> so Golden Promise was developed in the 1950s through some mutation breeding, um, but it was quickly uh, outclassed by more modern varieties within the 1960s. So you didn't see Golden Promise grown anywhere again. And also a variety called Maris Otter was grown in the 1960s. Uh, but newer, better breeding, high yields, those varieties just disappeared. Farmers wouldn't grow them. They're growing them again now because they say they impart a distinct flavour into the beer. So you're actually seeing a variety grown 60 years ago being regrown at a significant yield penalty to the farmer, <laughs> maybe 30, 40, 50 percent yield loss, um, but potentially the molster is paying him that difference <laughs> Um, because it, they can then say, well, we've got this single variety, uh, these heirloom varieties going in to make these craft beers. So there's opportunities there, and uh, we're doing some stuff. We're actually crossing uh, Maris Otter and Golden Promise with some modern varieties to see if we can genetically breed the flavour uh, into the varieties. So we had a bit of a look at this. We used two varieties in Australia, uh, nine samples from four regions, so New South Wales, South Australia and two areas in Western Australia. We made a sweet wort uh, from a fairly standard grist to liquor mash. Um, we found that overall regional effect was higher than a varietal effect. So we really couldn't distinguish through a sensory trial if there was any difference between the varieties, but certainly the Western Australian barley tasted different to the South Australian barley and it tasted different to the New South Wales barley. So there's definitely a regional effect. Um, again, samples with the higher gelatinisation temperature produce lower maltose uh, and these were less sweet because lower maltose meant higher non-fermentable sugars and those contribute mouthfeel. Uh, but certainly the, the enzymes had an impact here as well. Because we're mashing at a high temperature, um, these enzymes have a limited sh shelf life or li limited activity, so that's had an impact as well. So one of these lovely spiderweb plots uh, here's our two varieties, Commander and Gardener. Um, the main difference in the wort was this sweet corn flavour, which is basically, in most breweries, we consider an off flavour. It's DMS, um, dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, so it's actually an off flavour. And in this particular case, Commander was producing a slightly higher level of DMS. That is controlled during the malting process. So the way I made the malt, certainly provided the commander with more DMS. Um, that's just the way it happened. Uh, but we can actually see more differences here in the location. So the South Australia, uh, the New South Wales in the blue, and Western Australia in the green, there's actually a number of sensory parameters that there's difference uh, between these locations. So in summary of the sweet wort, um, the actual fermentable sugars did not have a strong influence overall. Uh, it was the non-fermentable sugars, although we didn't, didn't measure those. Um, we've actually found a difference between regions rather than uh, within varieties. Um, and we could actually put a descriptor against the samples from each location with the Western Australia has been having a sweet corn, uh, a DMS and a toffee flavour, uh, whereas the South Australian samples were malty and toffee. And that lovely cabbage flavour that we love, a love, love a sulphury smell. Uh, so hopefully uh, we're doing more late this year and early next year to validate some of this. <coughs> so just in summary, um, over a number of projects uh, and through some very generous industry funding, uh, we've done some detailed studies on starch, gelatinize, starch properties, including gelatinisation and the, its impact on fermentable sugars and general malt and brewing quality. Um, Protein content really um, has little effect to do with anything to do with starch. So uh, there's, still some, there's still a challenge for us and a challenge for the industry to, to deal with that. Um, certainly with the growth in the craft industry uh, where the expectations are different to the large commercial breweries and the craft industry seems to be driving a lot of this um, demand now on, on changes. But all this work has really just given us more questions. Um, we still really don't understand the genetics around starch structure and granules, especially expression, uh, expression in the field. Um, 
We're still going to get deeper into some of the structural effects on flavour and fermentation efficiency. At the moment, all of our methods, certainly the SEC, uh, is not easy. It's not, not something you can just put in the back of a ute and take out onto a farmer's property and measure the starch structure of his barley crop. Would be nice, but we can't do that. Uh, so we have to consider some simpler or surrogate methods here. And certainly the craft brewing industry is, for, for a lot of us, a, a sort of a, a new positive wave in the industry because they're driving demanding innovation. Um, and the craft brewers are innovative themselves. So we work with innovative brewers. They come to us with ideas or they say, what can we do to help them with ideas? Uh, so there's some lovely partnerships going on here with the craft industry. Uh, so we have had some, some reasonable outputs uh, in the last few years. Um, so what's next? Um, more collaborations with industry to consider some of these gaps. Um, so some of you have made me, heard me talk about, we're actually proposing and will hopefully run a malting and brewing science course for the undergraduates next year in SAFs. Um, so that's one of, one of my things on my job list, oh dear. Um, and we're applying for some breweries. Um, not applying to some breweries, we're gonna have our own breweries some nano breweries here. Have we talked about that, Rob? Um, <laughs> yep. So hopefully next year we'll have those in operation for when this food science course starts. Um, so we'll be one of a few universities in Australia that has that. Uh, but our focus is much bigger than and, uh, training. It's also research and industry involvement. So Bernadette.